we've been having a feast, a real feast these two days. The riches of heaven have been revealed to us. Some of us have heard these truths for so many years. There are different movements that God has raised up through the years by godly men, wonderful godly men. One of those movements was called the Christian Missionary Alliance. It started in the end of the 19th century by a very godly man called A.B. Simpson who uh, wrote that song we sometimes sing, once it was the blessing, now it is the Lord. And uh, once I sought for healing, now I seek for him alone, etc. All in all in Jesus, Jesus will I sing. Many years later, uh, maybe... 50, 60 years after the movement was founded. There was another godly man who was a pastor in that church, in that Christian Mission Alliance called A.W. Tozer. Some of us would have read his writings, A.W. Tozer. And he, once, as a young pastor, he went to, he was a really sincere godly man. He went to one of the older pastors in the Christian Missionary Alliance Church <clears throat> and asked him with this wonderful gospel that we preach of Jesus Christ as Savior, Baptizer <clears throat> and uh, A.B. Simpson used to preach about exchanging our self-life for Christ's life for the Christ life he asked this older man as a young pastor, Tozer why is it that <clears throat> These people who for so many years have heard these wonderful truths, who should be some of the sweetest saints on the face of the earth, are sometimes so sour and grumpy and hard to get along with, difficult to fellowship with, so hard and demanding. And he said, that wise old man, just kept quiet. He had no answer to give. I ask that same question today. Why is it so many who come regularly for the conferences, who hear some of these wonderful truths, who should be the sweetest, most gracious saints on the face of the earth, are sometimes so hard to get along with? Why is it some elders are so hard to fellowship with? Why is it people in the churches complain about that? Something is missing. We've got it all up here in the mind. We are stirred, but the stirring doesn't seem to last. We make decisions in conferences, but it doesn't last. It's all disappears after a while. Something is wrong. Yeah. <clears throat> I feel very often that in spite of all that we hear, many of us are like orphans. You know, there's an insecurity about orphans because they've never felt the kiss of a mother or the hug of a father growing up in an orphanage. Maybe they're given food, clothing, education and all, but there's something that orphans miss. The hug and intimacy of parents. That brings a security. Orphans are insecure. And I believe that a lot, as I've observed Christians for more than 50 years, more than half a century, I believe that insecurity is the root cause of so many sins. 
uh, orphans are jealous of others. They are very possessive. They don't want you, if, if you meet, you're friendly with an orphan, that orphan will not want you to be friendly with anybody else. Because they are so insecure. They are very possessive. If you become their friend, they want you. Possessive. They won't let you share you with anybody else. And if they see two people talking together, they say, oh, they must be talking about me. Suspicion, jealousy. And orphans are, if they get something, they want to keep it. They don't want to lose it. It's like, uh, like elders who don't want to lose their position. Or they want honor from people. They want acceptance all the time. Orphans can never stand a rebuke. Oh, they'll get gone to depression for days because somebody corrected them. Insecure, insecure, insecure. All of humanity was like that. From the days of Adam, when Adam lost his father, lost God, knowing God intimately in Eden, ever since that day, <clears throat> Adam and all his children have been insecure orphans in the world. Everybody under the old covenant. That's why you see some of those great saints falling into depression. The great John the Baptist, who was the greatest prophet of all, when he was imprisoned, just because Jesus didn't get him out of prison, do a miracle, and kill Herod, he, he began to doubt. And from prison he sends his disciples to, John the, to Jesus and says, Are you really the Messiah? I mean, he had heard the voice from heaven. Supposing you heard a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved son. Would you ever doubt after that? You think you won't. You will. John the Baptist did. When something you want desperately, your prayer that you asked for didn't get answered, the child you prayed for died instead of being healed, then you begin to doubt. Is, this really, is he really the Messiah? Is all this true? I've had people sit in CFC for many years who say, Brother Zach, I'll be honest with you. I remember one brother telling me this. He says, I'll be honest with you that sometimes I doubt. Is this Bible really God's word? Is there really, is Jesus really the only way? Because I've never seen him or heard him or anything like that. And then he says, he said to me, but there's one thing that keeps coming to me. I remember on one conference way back in 1983 or something, he said, a man came crawling through the aisle just as I was about to start a Bible study, I was up in the pulpit and he says he remembers that. He saw a man crawling up and, and he said, I saw you, Brother Zach, say to that person, in Jesus' name, lie down there. And the man went to sleep. And we had our Bible study and when the Bible study was over, he got up and he says, that day I realized there is power in the name of Jesus. And that, sometimes God does something like that. But then the same person became insecure after some time. And he left CFC. Insecurity. Insecurity. Orphans. Orphans. Always looking for attention. I must be the center of attention. I don't like anybody else to be the center of attention. There was a joke they used to say about a German a ruler in the early part of the 20th century, he always wanted attention. Uh, and if he went to the, a wedding, he wished he were the bride. And <laughs> if he went to a funeral, he wished he were the corpse in the car. Because <laughs> the attention was all centered around. Or are you like that? You find you like to have attention and everybody talks about you and thinks about you and you feel insecure if you're Live by yourself. You can never be insecure if you know God as your Father. And that's what the fullness of the Holy Spirit really came to bring. Turn with me to John's Gospel, chapter 14. John 14, and uh, Jesus, the first time he spoke about the Holy Spirit. 
about the coming of the Holy Spirit. It was the night before he went to the cross. He left that subject out completely in all his teaching. And just the night before he went to the cross, after they had broken bread, he had washed their feet. He says, I want to tell you something. Verse 15, John 14, 15. If you love me, there's only one proof of that. You will keep my commandments. And they had already heard his commandments. Very high standard. Love one another as I have loved you. That means be willing to lay down your life for one another. Are you brothers and sisters willing to lay down your life? You may lay down your life for your child. That even a heathen, godless, atheist mother will do. But to lay down your life for one another in who other believers? That's an almost impossible standard. Or love one another, a new commandment I give you, love one another exactly as I have loved you. How did he love me? He loved me by laying down his life for me. He gave up everything because he wanted me. And to have that type of relationship in the church where, brother, I don't want anything from you. And if you take something from me, I'm not going to fight for it. You just go right ahead. I, I love you and I want to love you as Jesus loved me. And Jesus is willing to lose everything to have me. And I'm willing to lose things for the sake of the church. That's the type of bond that God brings. Only God can do it. Bring that type of bond between believers where we are willing to give up everything. It's, it's that type of unity in which the church must grow. And so... It's so difficult to keep these commandments. <clears throat> if you love me, keep my commandments. Immediately the disciples would have thought, well, how in the world can we keep them? And Jesus said, yeah, I know your question. I know what question is coming in your mind. He said, I will ask the Father to give you a helper to keep the commandments. So you see, the first time that the, Jesus spoke about the Holy Spirit, it was in relation to keeping the commandments, not in relation to speaking in tongues, or healing, or any of these things. That's what we emphasize in CFC. The ministry of the Holy Spirit is to help us keep His commandments. He's a helper. And He said it in relation to keeping the commandments, and He'll be with you forever. And He said He's the Spirit of truth. The world cannot receive Him because He doesn't know Him. Right now, verse 17, He's only with you. But one day He'll be in you. Throughout the Old Testament, He was with different people, when he anointed people, even when it says John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Spirit, it was from the outside. He was not in him, he was with him. He was with Moses, he was with David, he was with Elijah, Elisha, but never in anybody. Why couldn't he be in anyone? Because everybody's heart was dirty. You could kill thousands of bulls and goats, but the heart is still dirty. There was only one thing that could cleanse the heart and that was the blood of Jesus Christ. And until the blood of Jesus Christ was shed, the Holy Spirit just could not come into anybody's heart. That's why there had to be a preparation period, uh, you know, with Israel being kept under the law before the Holy Spirit could come. But once Christ had shed his blood and risen from the dead and gone up to the Father, immediately the Holy Spirit could come. So he's with you but in that day he'll be in you. You know, like the cup, covered, you pour water on it. It flows and flows outside and blesses people. The inside of the cup remains dirty, like Samson's heart. But if you remove the lid and pour water in it, it overflows from within. And then the inside is clean and it flows out in blessing. That's the difference between old covenant fullness of this being filled with the Spirit upon and new covenant filled with the Spirit, which is from within and then overflowing. That's what he meant by he's with you till now, he will be in you on the day of Pentecost. And then he says, and when that happens, you know what's going to happen? When the Holy Spirit comes within you, you will not be an orphan anymore. So he spoke, to, when he spoke about the Holy Spirit, he spoke about freedom from being an orphan. I will come to you. 
And that is one of the greatest things that the Holy Spirit does. It says in Romans in chapter 8, <clears throat> that when the Spirit comes into our heart, Romans 8.15, when we receive the spirit of adoption, adoption is a word where uh, a father, it's not adoption in the sense we know today, where someone who's not your child, you adopt into your family. That's not, this is talking about another type of adoption which, you know, some some religions have where a child comes of age, 12 years old or something, their own child is adopted now as a son now, an inher one who is the heir. We can say he's made an heir. That's the meaning here. We've been made heirs of God in Christ. And the Holy Spirit comes in and shows us we are heirs along with Christ and cries out, Abba, Father. The Holy Spirit when the Holy Spirit really comes into us, it makes us know immediately God is our Father. That is the first thing. You don't have to brainwash a fellow, hey, listen, God is your Father, God is your Father, God is your Father. I often think that many Christians, their knowledge of God as a Father is a very kind Father who lives in a very distant country. Supposing your father was living in another country 10,000 kilometers away or 15,000 kilometers away. But he's a very kind father. He sends you letters. You've never seen him. From the time of your birth, you've never seen him. But he sends you gifts and he speaks to you, sends you, but you've never seen him. You've never felt him hug you. There's a sense in which you're still an orphan. You know him theoretically. He asks you, do you have a father? Yeah, I've got a father. Have you ever seen him? Never seen him. Has he ever hugged you? No, never hugged me. But I know he's there because I get his letters now and then and he sends us money for the family. There are people like that, you know, whose fathers are working in distant lands. I feel that many Christians know God like that. As a father who's in a distant land, we can s send emails to him and uh, tell him certain things we need and he sends us certain things that we need. But we never know him, hug us, you know, intimacy. I was like that for 16 years after I was born again. I had a father who was up there. He helped me in so many ways. He'd send me letters and I could send him letters. But a day came in my life when the Holy Spirit filled me. I could say, Daddy. Abba is a Hebrew word. I wish they had translated it in this English language into Dad. What a wonderful thing it is to say Dad. Oh, Dad, I'm in your arms. I'm secure. You hug me. It's a wonderful thing to know God is your Father. And I often think that I'm like a little child. Jesus said that to enter God's kingdom, you must be like little children. And I often think there's a song that we played at the time of my birthday, which says, you will always be a child in my eyes. And even when you're growing old, I hope you realize, God says, you will always be a child in my eyes. And I like that. However old I may be, I'm a child in God's eyes. And I feel secure with my heavenly father. His arms around me and he's hugging me and I sit on his lap. And I'm secure in the midst of a very insecure world. A lot of things that happen in this world even today, a lot of the worst things that are going to happen in the days to come. I want to say to you, my brothers and sisters, you need to know God as your dad. You need to let the Holy Spirit show you God is your dad, intimate, close to you. And Jesus, it says in John chapter 1, one of the main functions why he came to earth was not just to die for our sins. In John chapter 1, it says in verse 18, no one has seen God at any time. John 1.18 The only begotten Son of God who is in the bosom of the Father, He has explained Him. He has revealed Him. You see, I told, we saw in the tabernacle this veil, thick curtain, and God was on the other side of the veil and nobody knew what He was like. 
Because nobody has seen him. It says here, no one has seen God at any time. Who is this person living the other side of the whale? And the Pharisees said, we'll tell you what he's like. He's very strict. If you pluck a grain of wheat on the Sabbath day, he's going to come down hard on you. And they had all types of silly rules about um, you can't go travel a certain distance on the Sabbath day and you can't do this and you can't. They would take those laws of God and interpret it in thou shalt not lift a burden on the Sabbath day. That was a law in the Old Testament. They said, well, we got to decide now what the weight of your slippers are because every time you walk you're lifting a burden. So we decide what the weight of your slippers are. Uh, so that you're not supposed to, and they, you had to wear slippers, so they decided, look, the weight of your slippers must be so much. If it's more than that, it's a burden. And these guys, they, they didn't have a Bible. They were listening to this Pharisees, and they said, boy, we're scared to go inside the whale. It's some strict policeman or judge sitting there. And Jesus rent that veil one day and said, these Pharisees are liars. It's a dad who sits in there. He's not bothered about these silly rules that these people have made. That's not real God. And I want to tell you this. Jesus said that 2,000 years ago. But there are people sitting in CFC churches who still think that God is like that. They will criticize a sister who wears a, a 400 rupee artificial gold earring and say, you're not supposed to come to the church wearing that when that guy's own wife is wearing a 5,000 rupee sari. That's what I mean. Hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. There are people like that. There are people like that in CFC. There are new people who come CFC and some foolish sister will go and ask her, why are you wearing ornaments? I say, you know, there are babies in every church. You can't help it who say stupid things, who somebody comes to them, they don't know who it is, and that two-year-old says, who are you? Why have you come here? There are people like that, there are 40-year-old babies in CFC too, who go around saying stupid things and drive people away. There's nothing attractive about them. They, they, haven't, they don't know God as a father. They know a policeman. They know a judge who is uh, saying all types of things. I've had people uh, say to my wife, you know those designs on your sari, it's, it reminds me of some Hindu temple. And I said, boy, what wild, how wild your imagination goes, you know. <laughs> some small one inch design. I said, if I were a woman and I heard something like that, I'd wear a sari like that every single day. <laughs> <laughs> to drive these Pharisees out of the church. So much of legalism which prevents us from knowing God as a dad, a loving father. It's love that he wants. He said, the only two commandments I give you, love God with all your heart and love one another as yourself. And people break that down into silly little rules that will hurt others. Jesus reveals the father. I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11 and verse 25. Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent, and you have revealed them to babes. I want you to see a very important word there. Reveal. Revelation. In the Old Testament, there was zero revelation. It was understanding and knowledge. Revelation is a New Testament word. Revelation comes from the Holy Spirit. You remember when Simon Peter, Jesus asked, who do you think I am? And Simon Peter said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. How did he know that? Well, he hadn't studied the scriptures. He didn't even have a Bible at home. And the great rabbis and scholars and scribes who had studied the Bible day after day after day after day and they saw the Bible speaks about the seed of the woman will come to crush the serpent's head. They saw the Passover lamb in Exodus and 
the serpent lifted up in the wilderness, all referring to Christ and Isaiah 53, the, the servant of God would be sacrificed and the son of righteousness in Malachi, all the way, it's all about Jesus. <clears throat> and when they studied it, studied it, studied it, and when Jesus came to them, it, they said, this is the prince of devils. He's the prince of devils. <clears throat> Even though they had studied the scriptures every Saturday. But Peter, who hadn't studied all those scriptures, he said, you're the Christ, you're the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, because... <clears throat> If I were to paraphrase those words, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. Matthew 16, 17. That means your human intelligence did not show this to you. <clears throat> but my Father gave you revelation. This simple fisherman understood in a moment what those great scholars who had studied the Bible for years could not understand. Those 60-year-old scholars could not understand what 30-year-old Peter understood by revelation. The great word in the New Testament is revelation. Reveal, revelation. Take a concordance sometime and study the word reveal and revelation in the New Testament. You'll be amazed. It's not primarily understanding with, in the intellect, but revelation in the spirit. Paul says in Galatians 1, it pleased the Lord one day to reveal Again, he uses that word. The great secret of Paul and Peter was this. Not that they were clever. One was clever, one was not. It doesn't make a difference. It says here in Galatians in chapter 1 that one day it pleased God, verse 15 and 16, to reveal his son, not outside me on the road to Damascus, but in me. It pleased God through His grace. He had called me, verse 15, from my mother's womb. But I was completely blind. I studied the scriptures. And I thought this is a false prophet. All his uh, followers must be killed because the Old Testament law was that. All false prophet and all, the pro all his followers must be killed. And he did it, did it. Till one day God revealed His Son in Him. Then He was changed. Immediately. You know, when revelation comes and hits you, you're radically changed. You'll be willing to give up everything in the world. So many times when we ask, we say, ask people to receive Jesus into their heart, they say it. But I wonder in my heart, have they really got this revelation in their heart that gee, who Jesus is? And have they got a revelation now? God is now my Father. There's something missing in so much of our salvation. We need the Holy Spirit. We need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We will reveal God as a Father. It's a wonderful thing. You know, that's what Jesus tried so much to impress upon His disciples. You don't have to be worried. I know the world is a very insecure place to live in. And that's why... I'm sending the Holy Spirit to reveal God as your Father. And I believe that many of you sitting here, you need to get that revelation from God. as He's your dad who cares for you. It's because of that that he said, don't be anxious. Your Heavenly Father knows what you have need of before you ask Him. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, verse 8, verse 7. Don't pray like the non-Christians with their meaningless repetition. They think they will be heard because of their many words. They think they'll be heard because they prayed for so long. The prophets of Baal prayed for so long, nothing happened. Elijah prayed for 30 seconds. And the fire came. The non-Christian thinks, if I pray for a long time, I'll be heard. He said, don't be like that. Just repeating, repeating certain things. Meaningless repetition. Because, don't be like them. Because, verse 8, your father knows 
what you need before you ask him. The next time you pray, think of this verse, Matthew 6, 8. Your father knows what you need before you ask him. This is what the Holy Spirit tells me. He's your dad. He knows what you need before you ask him. Therefore what? Therefore, for this reason, verse 25, I say don't be anxious. Connect these two verses together. Read verse 8 and 25 together. Your father knows what you need before you ask him. Therefore, for this reason, don't be anxious. What is the request that is uppermost in your heart today? Let's be practical. Let's do some homework. I think in many of your hearts, there's an uppermost request. Some, usually some earthly thing. Some uppermost request. Shall we do a little homework today? While we're sitting here. Do you believe that your father knows what you need? Before you ask him. Therefore. Don't be anxious. Look at the birds of the air. Verse 26. They don't sow. They don't reap. They don't gather into barn. Yet your father feeds them. Do you believe that you are more value than those birds? Like that little. Poem which says one bird talks to another and says, Why are these human human beings so anxious and worried? And the other bird says, Maybe they don't have a heavenly father like we have. Maybe that's why they're so anxious and worried. We're okay. <laughs> Think of a bird talking like that to another. Is it because they saw you? That they talk like that? And he says, Look at all the flowers, the lilies in the field, verse twenty eight. They don't work hard, yet they get they're clothed by the Father. And even Solomon in all his glory, verse 29, was not clothed like this. If God, the Father, so clothes the grass of the field, O oh, men of little faith, won't he do that for you? I believe the greatest need in the days to come is security, to know God as our Father. Very, very important. Even when everybody leaves you. Remember Jesus once told his disciples. Yeah you have stood by me all this time. But a time is coming. John 16 verse 32. This is just before they went to the garden of Gethsemane. In John 16 32 he said. The hour is coming. And it has already come. You will all run away to your own home. John 16 32. And you leave me alone. But I'm not alone. My father is with me. I remember when we started preaching the truths we preached in CFC way back in 75. The Lord asked me, will you continue to stand for these truths if everybody leaves you? I said, yes, sure. I'd come to know God as my father. And it didn't matter to me now whether people stood with me or how many people came to our church it never bothered me one bit because one man with God is a majority remember this my brothers and sisters if you are lonely in some situation, some of you come from non-Christian homes and I really can sympathize with the struggle you have your parents are non-Christians and you feel you're alone there in the house. You're not alone. If God is with you, you're a majority. That everybody be against you. You're a majority. This is the thing that gave boldness to the apostles to face lions and spears. And Thomas, who came to India, was speared to death. How did, they, how did Thomas come all alone to India? How did he have that boldness? He knew the Father. That's the thing. I believe that is the great need. The first person of the Trinity, the Father, we need to know Him intimately. That will bring security. Then we go to the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ. Jesus said, the Holy Spirit, John 16, He will take of mine, verse 14, and show it to you. He will take of Jesus and show it to you. He'll, 
not only reveal the father that's great like he, re- he cries out daddy but then he reveals Jesus to me he reveals the second person of the trinity to me he takes up Jesus and shows me how Jesus was and then I see how Jesus was on this earth and the Holy Spirit shows me Jesus came in a body like yours he was made like you in everything except that he had no sin in him but he was capable of being tempted just like you so now I have a revelation of Jesus this is the other thing we need to see we need to see God is our father that delivers us from our orphan syndrome and insecurity I know him as dad I don't have to be anxious anymore you know like whatever problems that may be in a home a little two year old child is not bothered whatever problem think of your little one year old child or two year old you think that child is bothered about all the problems you father and mother are worrying about uh, you have to, your landlord has asked you to vacate the house or you're losing your job and you don't know what the two year old is happy and playing and says, I'm not bothered about all these things you go to him and say do you know your dad's leave, leaving, losing his job he doesn't have another job he doesn't have much in his bank account he says just leave me alone I want to play I don't care you go and talk to my dad about all that I'm not interested imagine my brothers and sisters living on earth like that is it possible yes it is it's not that we don't care for our responsibilities we do what we can but the anxiety part is taken out of us and it will make you work much better make you do everything in love much better if anxiety can be taken out of our system insecurity anxiety it's a wonderful thing to know God is a father and then he you see that's the beginning we know him as a child to know God is a father and then as we grow up the Holy Spirit says now you need to take responsibility and learn to live like Jesus and immediately another question comes anxiety how in the world can I live like Jesus I'm such a rotten old sinner I can be forgiven by him but to live like him impossible we say and yet John at the age of 95 says in 1 John 2 6 the one who says he abides in Christ must walk as Jesus walked I remember reading the testimony of John Wesley, one of the greatest saints that Christianity has seen. He said, when I read that verse, the one who says he abides in him ought to walk as he walked, I didn't think of it as a burden. I thought of it as a fantastic possibility. Hey! I mean, he didn't say hey, I'm just adding that. I can walk like Jesus. How do you look at that verse? Oh, a burden. <clears throat> oh, I have to walk like Jesus or a possibility. Imagine a wretch like me who's been saved from the gutter, having messed up my life and hurt God in so many ways. Now I can walk as the Son of God walked on the earth. In every area I can live on earth in the same way Jesus lived with a dignity without fear Jesus was never afraid oh I may get cancer you think he was living in that type of fear a lot of sickness going around I may catch it I don't know what will happen and many people are dying I may die never I can live like Jesus this is the Christianity we preach in CFC this is why they call us a heret- heretics and false teachers. Of course the devil wants you to believe it's a false teaching. Because he wants you to live like an orphan, insecure, fighting, quarreling all your life. That's the best way to the devil to turn people away from God, from the truth. Tell them, oh that's heresy. That's all wrong teaching. That's the way he makes people turn away from the truth. I'm not surprised. You think the devil wants you to walk as Jesus walked? Tell me, who will be most upset if you start walking as Jesus walked from tomorrow onwards? You think God will be upset? Oh, he started walking as Jesus walked. 
I'll tell you who will be upset. It's the devil. <clears throat> then who's trying to stop you from even attempting it? Who's trying to stop you from believing that it is possible? If the Bible says so, it must be possible. Will you ask your child to put a 500 ton weight on his head and walk? No. If you as an evil father or mother will not burden your children with commands they cannot keep, how in the world can God tell me to walk as Jesus walked if it's not possible? It's a fantastic possibility that the devil wants to blind your eyes to so they say it's not possible for you. And if you see one or two people walking like that, you can say, yeah, yeah, it's possible for him, he's a special case. Well, it doesn't work for you. And then you believe another lie. That that is a special case. A few people God gives grace like that, but not for you. You know, God sends across your path, now and then, a godly man whose life challenges you. I experienced that as a young Christian. Not very frequently. Once in a while, I, I think of two or three people who came across my path who were really godly. And I saw something in them. I mean, I don't know how they preached and all, but I saw something in their life that really challenged me, something of the beauty of Christ. And I said, Lord, I want that. I've never, ne never in my life have I wanted to preach like somebody. Maybe when I was a young Christian, I was immature and I attempted foolish things, but... That's not been my goal, but I've seen some people live a godly life. And I said, Lord, I want to live like that. Have you, have you, and I believe that God allowed such people to come across my path, to challenge me, to show me that it was possible. These guys are not telling lies. They're not hypocrites. They're genuine. It's possible. And that hope gets stirred in my heart. I too can walk like that. And God will send across your path now and then a really godly man, one here and one there, and you will see. Okay, you're disappointed with so many Christians. Okay, fine. It's like God told Satan, okay, all these fellows are hypocrites and crooks, but have you seen Job? He's different. That was one man. And like that, God may send across your path now and then a man who you know is genuine. He's not exactly like Jesus, but boy, you see a possibility in you, as you see his life, that can happen in your life too. That's what challenged me. And the Holy Spirit shows us how Jesus lived on this earth, tempted exactly like me. It says in Hebrews chapter 2 that he was made like his brothers in everything. Just like the devil would like to hide from your eyes that God is your father. The next thing the devil wants to hide from your eyes is that Jesus was a man like you. I mean, even though it's written plainly in scripture, people won't believe it. Hebrews 2, 17. He had to be made like his brothers in all things. In spite of a statement like that, some people say he was made like Adam. There's not a single verse that says he was made like Adam. He was made like his brothers. And somebody, once, somebody asked Jesus, Who are your brothers? He said, These who hear my word and do it. Those are my brothers, he said. So we know who the brothers of Jesus are. On the day of his resurrection, he told Mary Magdalene, Go and tell my brothers. Who were they? Those disciples. They were not perfect. But he said to Mary Magdalene, Go and tell my brothers that I am ascending to your father and my father. That's you and me, born again children of God. We're not perfect. But he was made like his brothers in everything. So that he can become a merciful and faithful high priest. You see, the Jews had to, be, had to have one among them who could be their high priest. Not somebody who came from Mars or Mercury or somewhere. Someone who was right part of their race. And he's made like us. And because this one who was made like us, was, verse 18, was tempted. In, he had to suffer in that temptation. Suffer means what? He had to deny himself. Denying oneself is a suffering. He denied himself and suffered 
because he knows what it is to deny himself and suffer and overcome, he is able to run to help those who are tempted today. And again in chapter 4 verse 15, he is one who can sympathize with our struggle in temptation. You know how you can sympathize with someone who is facing something that you have already faced. Supposing you lost an only child. Supposing you had only one child. And that child was the darling of your heart and one day got sick and you prayed and prayed and it died. And yet oh, you overcame it by the grace of God. You found comfort in God. And years later you meet another mother whose only child died. You can sympathize with her. I can't. But you can. Because you've gone through that experience. And here it says we've got a high priest who can sympathize with our weakness. What weakness? The weakness of our flesh in the time of temptation. He knows it. Don't you feel weak when you're tempted? I feel terribly weak when I'm tempted. But he knows it. Because he was weak too. It's good to know that. The Holy Spirit shows you one who can sympathize with your struggle and your weakness in the time of temptation. You're not alone. What a comfort that mother who's lost an only child can put her arms around this other mother who's lost the child and says, I know exactly what you're feeling. I've gone through it myself. He, she can comfort her more than I can. Even if she's a new convert. Because she's gone through it herself. And it's, that's what he says. That Jesus can sympathize with my struggle. When I'm facing some terrible temptation. And I'm struggling and struggling. He can sympathize with it. Because he faced it himself. He faced the struggle. He had to battle. It says in chapter 5 verse 7. In the days of his flesh. How did he overcome this temptation? He prayed. With loud crying and tears. He prayed that the spiritual death might not touch him. Oh Father, save me from the spiritual death that can come to me if I yield to this temptation. That's why you would sometimes go into the wilderness and pray. And I remember understanding that and is saying, now I know in the early days when I was seeking for victory, I, I, now I know why I cannot conquer sin. That desperate crying is not there. I want to follow Jesus, but I don't want to cry so desperately, even though I'm a slave. I want you to turn to Exodus in chapter 2. We see an example of a few people who were slaves. Slaves in Egypt, just like we are slaves of sin. The Israelites were slaves in Egypt for 430 years. And you've been a slave of sin for many years, even though you're a believer, even though you come to CFC. There are some sins that keep plaguing you, plaguing you, plaguing you. And you've heard the messages, you know the theory, but it doesn't seem to work. In your case, it, is, it seems to have worked in some other people, it doesn't work in me. This message is for you. It came about, Exodus chapter 2, verse 23. In the middle of that verse, the sons of Israel sighed. What's a sigh? Oh God. We've been slaves so long. You can hardly pray. <gasps> oh God. When are you going to help us? Because of their bondage. They were not asking for wealth. They were not asking for a new car or a new house or anything like these foolish Christians are asking today. They were signed because of their bondage. Oh God. We're slaves. Every day we feel the whip of sin saying, Obey me. Obey me. Get angry. Lust. Be jealous. Fight. Be proud. Exalt yourself. Be hard. Be cruel. I hear the whip, Lord. And I'm fed up. I don't want to be a slave. And they cried out. And they cry for help because of their bondage, rose up to God. And God heard their groaning. And I want to ask those of you who are
praying to God for victory. Do you believe God hears your groaning? And God remembered his covenant with that. In that case, Abraham, he's made a covenant with us through Jesus Christ, through his blood. And God saw, and God took notice. The very next verse, he sent Moses. That's a beautiful passage of how God can lead us. You know that Jesus prayed with loud crying and tears. I've done that at night, not with a loud mouth. You can, I've discovered you can cry in your heart without any sound coming out of your mouth. Yeah, I've discovered that. You can have a loud cry in your heart without anybody around you hearing a sound. And the tears come out of your eyes and wet your pillow as you pray. And I find one of the best times to pray is when you're in bed. The world is asleep. And there you are alone with God. Everybody in your room, house is asleep. And you're awake and you're praying, God, I slipped up again today. I want to walk like Jesus. I want to act like Jesus towards every person I meet. And I didn't react like that to the person who put petrol into my scooter and spilled some of it on my clothes. I didn't react in the proper way there. I didn't react the way Jesus would have reacted if that happened. Lord, forgive me. And I cry, Lord, when will I be free from this? When will I, in every situation, react the way Jesus reacted? I hope there will be a cry in your heart before the end of this conference. It will make you another person. Think of that verse. They sighed. They cried. And we read that Jesus prayed with loud crying and tears. And it says in Hebrews in chapter 5 that he was heard because of his godly fear. That's why he was heard. It doesn't say he was heard because he's the son of God. Because of his godly fear. That means there was a terrific fear. Oh, lest I sin and hurt my father. See, there are two types of fear of God. One is the fear that <clears throat> God may hurt me. The other <clears throat> is the fear that I may hurt God. Now, which fear do you think it is here in <clears throat> He wasn't afraid that God would hurt him. No. God would never hurt Jesus. And by the way, he won't hurt you either. But Jesus had a fear that I may hurt my father. That's the right type of fear of God. Oh God, I don't want to hurt you. There's a beautiful verse in Psalm 139, which reads like this. Psalm 139 <clears throat> Verse 23 and 24, the last two verses. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts and see if there's any hurtful way in me. Hurtful way of pain. And the meaning is, is there anything in me that's hurting you, God? That's how it says in the Living Bible. Show me if there's anything that makes you sad. Anything that's hurting you, Father, show me. What a wonderful prayer. Lord, search me and show me if there's anything in my life that's hurting you, that's making you feel sad because I, your child, am behaving like this. I believe that should be a constant prayer. I remember once preaching on this and printing out little cards with that. Show me, Lord, show me anything in my life that makes you sad. Printing it and giving out to everybody in our church and say, keep it in your sitting room. Pray that prayer daily. Lord, show me anything in my life that's making you sad. I pray that regularly. <clears throat> and I will pray that until I become completely like Christ. I believe that until I become completely like Christ, until, like we heard this earlier, that until the divine nature takes over completely and makes me 
not struggle to do something, but automatically, when tempted, that my reaction is, there may be a struggle, but the reaction is to do good, to love and not to hate, to trust God and not to be fearful and anxious. Lord, that nature, that which you, you've given me the Holy Spirit, have that, I want it. I want to be like Jesus, if that's your passion. As, if, as you've heard me often speak, the destination for us, Romans 8, 29, is to become like Jesus Christ. Not, as we heard earlier, not victory over sin, no. Victory over sin is a path in Romans 6. Romans is a systematic presentation of the gospel. Chapter 1, godless sinners. Chapter 2, religious sinners. Chapter 3, all are sinners. And from chapter 3 onwards, forgiveness of sins through the death of Christ, justification, declared righteous by faith, chapter 4, chapter 5, victory over sin, yes, needed in chapter 6, then freedom from legalism, chapter 7. That usually happens when people get victory over sin. The next thing is they become legalists, looking down on others, freedom from legalism, and then you come to chapter 8, life in the spirit, where what the law could not accomplish the Holy Spirit accomplishes, and then Romans 8, 29, the goal that we might be conformed to the image of His Son. That is the goal. All that Romans 6, 14 and all is on the way. Victory over sin and freedom from legalism. Our goal is to become like Jesus. That the very nature of Jesus will be in me. What a wonderful thing it is. Compare that with the nature of Adam. Think back to the days when you were not born again when you had only the nature of Adam in you. Don't you think the nature of Adam did a first class job of making you tell lies, making you hate, making you jealous, making you bitter, making you anxious? No problem. <laughs> it was so easy to be anxious and to hate and to uh, get angry and yell at people and uh, tell lies and cheat and do all types of things. And nature of Adam spontaneously flowed out of you. Do you think the Holy Spirit will do a lesser work when He puts the nature of Christ in you that it will spontaneously flow out of you that you learn to forgive and love and be good and be humble and never seek to lord it over others and seek to bless when people curse you? Are you saying the nature of Adam could do a better job than the Holy Spirit? Oh, men and women of little faith, let's trust that God can do a greater work in us and the nature of Adam did so perfectly in us, ruining us. The, Jesus has come to not only forgive us, but to make his nature well up in us. When Jesus said to the woman of uh, Samaria, you drink this water in the well, you'll thirst again. But if you drink of the water that I give you, it'll be a well, a spring of water, springing up, springing up. Not drawing with, well, with a bucket. It is a spring of water that springs up and springs up and satisfies you'll never thirst again you'll never thirst because this satisfies you completely a life of victory he shows us Jesus not only that we can walk as he walked in our life and he shows us how he fulfilled his ministry Jesus didn't only live a godly life he served his father and he stood against the religious system of his day. And that's what God has called CFC to stand for, against the religious systems of our day. And I was studying in the scriptures, what is it that made Jesus angry? I read a verse like Ephesians 4.26, which says, Be angry, but not sinful anger. I read the verse like that. Be angry, but don't let it be sinful anger. So in other words, I have a command there's a command in the Bible that says, be angry, but don't let it be sinful anger. Unfortunately, most of the time we are angry, it is sinful anger. Sinful anger is when somebody hurts you. Jesus never got angry when people slapped him, called him the devil, spat on him, insulted him in so many ways. Ah, you were born of fornication, nobody knows who your father is. He never got angry. You're the prince of devils. He never got angry. Whatever people did to him, he never, never got angry. Anything concerning him. So I said, what is this? Be angry, 
but don't let it be sinful. So I said, okay, Jesus is my dictionary. Whenever I don't understand a verse in scripture, which is the written word, I go to the word made flesh. I say, ah, the word made flesh is my dictionary. Where was he angry without sin? And I see two times in Jesus' life, he's angry. And the Holy Spirit wants me to make like, make me like him, not only in my overcoming sin, but in my ministry. And you also must be like that. The only two times that Jesus became angry was one, when he saw all these people making money in the name of God. And it's written, he did it once at the beginning of his ministry in John chapter 2. And he did it once at the end of his ministry, as you read in Matthew's Gospel. He did it twice. Let's take the John chapter 2 incident where he went into the temple and he saw all these people selling oxen, John 2.14, sheep and money changers. And they were making money for themselves, saying, hey, you fellows have come to offer sacrifice, we'll sell you. Another fellow says, hey, I'll sell it cheaper. Don't take his sheep, I'll give you, I've got better sheep. To offer another fellow says, no, no, I can give you something else, better sheep. This going on in the temple, in the name of offering sacrifice to God, and these fellows competing with each other to make profit. And Jesus, this is a beautiful verse, he made a scourge of cords. He didn't have anything ready. So he told his disciples, can you just go and get some string from somewhere? Any type of string, they're wondering what he wants string for. And they go and pick up any old cloth or something like that. They go pick up all these shreds from here and there. And he sits in a corner of the temple and twists it. And they wonder what he's doing. I like this picture of Jesus twisting. <laughs> it reminds me of uh, sitting and preparing a message to hit all these money changers <laughs> today in Christianity. <laughs> How shall I do it, Lord? Give me a real whip. <laughs> and he sat. Uh, he's my example, I tell you. It took him some time to make a whip that would really dry these fellows out. And he took it and that's the way you should prepare a sermon against such people. And he drove them out of the temple, verse 15, and said, take these things away. Stop making my father's house a house of making money, of business. Today the father's house has become a place of business all over Christendom. We saw that 40 years ago, thankfully. And that's why we stood against it. That we will be stood against it for 40 years. We'll stand against it till Jesus comes. The principle of Babylon is business. Revelation chapter 18. The merchants of the earth weep because they've lost their business. Christmas is such big business. Even the non-Christians put banners of Christmas sale and all that. It's business. It's business, business. Everybody making money in the name of Jesus. Everybody, non-Christians. I heard a joke about this, about a, a, a children in a school being asked, what did you do for Christmas? And uh, some children said, we are Roman Catholics and we went for the mass and we sang and we came back and opened the Christmas presents. And then uh, the Protestants said, we went for Sunday morning service and we came back. We also had... Christmas presents and uh, the Jewish man who doesn't believe in Jewish child doesn't believe in Jesus he says my father is, has a store selling gifts which Christians come to buy at Christmas time and uh, all our shelves were empty at Christmas time so we held hands and sang what a friend we have in Jesus <laughs> business 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 <laughs> This is it. The non-Christians here in Commercial Street will sing that. What a friend we have in Jesus. We So much of business at Christmas time. This is Babylon. And it's happening in the church too. People make coming rich in the name of Jesus. Pastors. And that's why we decided 40 years ago that we take some radical steps in the matter of finances. Because Jesus was angry. And we didn't want Jesus ever to be angry with CFC. Not even the slightest bit. So we decided, starting with me and Ian, we started 
that we would never take any salary from CFC. Zero. We would never take a gift. We would support ourselves. It was a struggle for me, it was a struggle for him as we began. It's less of a struggle now, but it was a tremendous struggle in those early days. And I think more for him than for me. And we said we are going to take the stand. And as churches began to be added to us, we said to them, our elders will never take one cent for preaching. No. There are secular aspects of our ministry, like we employ cooks to cook for us. We pay them. We employ people to pack our books and send them. We pay them. That's not... Um, that's a secular part of our ministry. But for the ministry of the word, the elders will be paid zero. And now we have over 120 elders in over 60, 70 churches. Not one of them receives a single paisa for their work. It's a miracle. There's not a single other church in India that can talk, talk about it. Another thing, this is just one part of it. We decided we would never take an offering. No bags being passed around. 40 years, 60, 70 churches, no offering. We keep a box because we saw Jesus sat next to a box and the widow came and put money in. So we see that's the way it must be. Those who want to put in can put in. I don't know who puts in, but we've always had enough. Throughout these 40 years, we serve people, as you see in the conferences, free. And if you can live with the simple accommodation we provide, even the accommodation is free. We've received freely from the Lord. We give freely. And we're not stingy. God has given us and we bless people. I remember when there were 5,000 people in one place and Jesus, uh, uh, the disciples started calculating how much money will it cost to feed these people at the conference and Jesus said, feed them. That's the word that we decide to follow. We'll feed them freely. God will provide for us. He multiplied the loaves in those days. He multiplies the money today and um, gives us everybody to provide accommodation, everything. He is the same. This God who lived in that time 2,000 years ago is the same today and I said we want to prove that in a poor country like India where there's no social security where people have to pay for everything poor brothers and sisters we will prove that almighty God is the same and we'll have enough to build buildings without asking anybody for money and we will have enough to build multitudes of church buildings because we can't rent buildings in many places because of the non-Christians who will not allow you to have a Christian meeting in their place. So we are compelled to build buildings and God provides. We taken a, We said we'll never send a report of our work. In 40 years, we've never sent a report of our work uh, to anywhere about what we have done. Nobody knows what we are doing except among our fellow elders. Nobody knows what we are doing. If you go to the CFC website, You'll think there's only one church in India, CFC Bangalore. Try and look for branches, no branches. Go and search the website. Um, what is happening is Brother Zach traveling somewhere. You go and search the website, no indication of it. I mean, now people discover through the live stream something, but otherwise we're not. We don't advertise our work at all. We don't send letters asking people for money. We have never done that in all these years. A radical stand in, in the area of money because... Jesus said, my house must have nothing to do with merchandise and money. It's very, very important. Our books sold at prices for which they are printed. You're paying for the paper and the printing ink. You're not paying for the material in it. It's free. That's why we put all the books on the internet. No Christian publisher will ever, ever allow you to put their books on the internet. You know that? Because they say, if you put it on the internet, people won't buy the books. I see, we're not bothered whether people buy our books or not. We want to spread the word around the world. What is the second thing that Jesus got angry with? And that's in, you read in Mark's Gospel, in chapter 3. He, there was a man with a withered hand in one place, and 
he wanted to heal him. And the Pharisees were watching, verse 2, to see whether to heal on the Sabbath. Mark 3, verse 2. And Jesus, verse 5, looked around at them with anger. Wow. I wish I could see a picture of his eyes and his face there in that synagogue. Angry with legalists. That's the second thing Jesus was angry with. Legalism. He was angry with making money in the name of Christ, in the name of God. And he was angry with legalists who picked up little commandments and amplified them and made life miserable for people. We have faced that. We have faced it in CFC. We have faced it in Kerala, Tamil Nadu. Legalists who are particular about little things make life miserable for these people. Some teeny weeny little um, commandment and impose it on people and forget about the law of love to God and love to man. I want to hate it. I want to look at with anger at such people. I want to be like Jesus. I want to look with anger at people who make money in the name of Christ today, whether it's on the television screen or anywhere. And I want to speak with anger to them. Don't make God's house a place of making money. And when I see legalists who try to make life miserable for other people so that they don't liberate them, I have to say to them, you don't get into the kingdom of God yourselves and these poor people who want to get in, you stop them with all your legalism. I want to be against it. I want to not just say gently, oh dear brother, sister, that's not the way to do it. No. I want to speak to them with anger. Then I can obey that command in Ephesians 4.26. Be angry without sinning. Only two things Jesus was angry with. Making money in the name of of Christ in the name of God and legalism picking up commandments to they don't apply to themselves but to other people you can't do this you can't do that see this verse you can't do this I say to people why don't you leave it to godly humble elders to guide these people so much of legalism there is I'm sorry to say there is still this legalism in some of our churches in Tamil Nadu in Kerala it's there. I see it. I get sick and tired of it when I see it. I get angry because poor people are being oppressed by legalistic elders. They haven't seen how angry. Jesus is the same yesterday, today and forever. If he looks down from heaven at such elders and churches, I want to say to you in the name of Jesus, he is looking at you with anger, not with kindness. Get rid of the legalism in your life. Very, very important. CFC has stood against making money and stood against legalism. Making rules for people and all types of things. This is the type of dress you must wear and this is the type of dress you cannot wear. This is the type of shoes you must wear or this is the type of thing you cannot wear jeans when you come to church. You can wear jeans when you go there. All types of rules. You can't have this and you can't have that and you can't have the other thing. No, mainly related to dress. Modesty in dress is a good thing. I'll tell you why. Because you're tempting other young men to sin if you come with your tight-fitting clothes and exposing your flesh. We stand against sin. So we hate immodesty in your dress, but we don't make rules about what type of clothes you should wear and make rules you can't do this and you can't do that and you can't do the other thing. So many little things. You can't go for an examination on a Sunday. Where does it say that? The Bible says all days are the same before God. There's no holy day today. There's all Old Testament legalism. You can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do the other thing. So many rules people make. I want to look at all of them with anger. This is what it means to walk as Jesus walked in our life and our ministry. And I praise God for brothers who are free from that legalism with whom I'll be able to work. Brother Ian is an exceptional example in that area. We've had wonderful fellowship because he's a man who's totally free from legalism. And it's been a delight for me to work with him more than with any other elder. Some are slowly getting free from that legalism, thankfully. Praise the Lord. I thank God for those who are liberated. And I want to encourage all of you, especially elders, because you're the ones who lead. You, you will not 
God will not build your church. He'll look at, with anger at your church because of your legalism. The way you make life miserable for some people in your church. I want to say to you in Jesus' name, if you've never heard it before, Jesus is angry with you. But he doesn't have to continue like that. You've, you've been delivered from the area of money. You're very upright in that. What about legalism? The second thing Jesus is angry with. Are you, do you equally hate that as you hate making money in the name of Christ? If I were to ask all of you, how many of you want to make money in the name of Jesus Christ? You say, oh, I hate it. Do you hate legalism in the same way? Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, please help us to walk as Jesus walked. Know you as our Father. Help each one of us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.